In this video, we will explore the extent to which the New Deal improved the economic status and position of women. By the time Roosevelt won the 1932 election, significant progress had been achieved by women, most notably in securing the right to vote in 1919 and its ratification in 1920. Throughout the Roaring Twenties, there were also examples of women who benefited from the economic boom, as well as those who did not. But when the stock market crashed in October 1929, the shockwaves that thundered through American society left no one untouched. Roosevelt is frequently celebrated as one of the greatest American presidents of all time, yet it remains controversial how far women benefited from the reforms in his New Deal program. To some extent, the advancements made by women were clear and obvious. In Eleanor Roosevelt, the First Lady, America had a strong advocate for the inclusion of more women in public office. The appointment of Frances Perkins as Secretary for Labour was groundbreaking as she was the first woman to hold a cabinet post. Perkins had spent her life working with poor people and immigrants, focusing particularly and effectively on worker safety and security. And Mary Jewson was the director of the Women's Division of the Democratic National Party, chair of the Women's Division Advisory Committee, and member of the Social Security Board. Now, these and other examples show a major advance in the employment of women in government. Indeed, Susan Ware argues that there was a considerable influx of high-powered women into politics and government who formed an important network for the future. However, much to their dismay, this extraordinary and unprecedented array of female brain power and access to influence could not assure a fair deal for women. As executive orders and legislation were put into effect during Roosevelt's first term, gender discrimination was the norm. For example, having political rights did not translate into being able to achieve social justice in New Deal legislation. The Aid to Dependent Children Act of 1935 aimed to support women who were unable to work and where there was no male head of the household. However, in order to receive this benefit, women were made to undergo a humiliating interview where they would have to explain why they were a single parent. Other aspects of the New Deal discriminated against mothers and married women in an attempt to boost employment for men. Women were in the front line of job losses, both in federal and state posts, and also in private industry and commerce, where the pressure was to save the jobs of the men. You may recall at GCSE studying how women in Nazi Germany were forbidden from working. The experience in the USA was not quite as severe, but the parallels are clear. The Social Security Act of 1935 introduced welfare benefits for poor families. And this benefited married women, despite not being designed for them. However, African American women were less likely to benefit, as many of them worked as domestic servants, and so were not covered by this act. There was no attempt in the legislation to secure equal wages. Indeed, the 1938 Fair Labour Standards Act did set new minimum levels for wages and this was a benefit for women. However, the minimum level for women was lower than that for men. A female teacher, for example, earned 20% less than her male counterpart in 1939. Even female white-collar workers were paid at lower rates than male factory workers. Ironically, the principle of lower pay for female workers had been established by the National Recovery Administration in 1933 under the leadership of none other than Frances Perkins. And this demonstrates the challenge that lay in making progress for women when even FDR's most significant appointee had to sign in legislation that discriminated against women on one of the most important issues. Susan Ware notes that if there was discrimination against married women, then it merely reflected the attitudes of the American public. She quotes a 1936 Gallup poll 
in which four-fifths of those asked agreed that married women with working husbands should not work and take jobs from men or single women. That said, women did make some real gains, such as the reduction in their working hours, the abolition of child labour, and the right of all workers to join a union. However, there were more married women working in 1940 than there had been in 1933. Perhaps that is what progress really does look like. So, even the most influential of women during FDR's presidency had to accept glaring inequalities. The desire for equal rights expressed by the more radical National Women's Party had limited influence, and there remained a huge gap between the implications of equality in the 19th Amendment and the actual degree of equality achieved. Now, ultimately, we can look to the Farm Security Act of 1937 as a snapshot of the position of women during the New Deal. This act did help to improve conditions for many of the poorer southern farmers, but it did little about the traditional unfairness of rural life for women. The failure to help rural women was noted by a sociologist in 1939, who noted that the pattern is for the women to do everything inside the house, for the man to occupy himself on the farm. So far, this sounds fairly evenly balanced but the wife does the field work also for about half the year in addition to her traditionally allocated sphere of labour. This reminds us that legislation could only achieve so much and that the attitudes in society would remain fixed until well after the Second World War.